In this video, we're going to talk about our second hypothesis test, the one-sample t-test, as well as the Cohen's d effect size for a one-sample t-test. Before I tell you anything about the t-test, though, I want to start with what our goal is. For each of the analyses we're going to learn in the remainder of this video series, I'm going to start with a goal slide to really introduce when this sort of analysis is appropriate, what we're trying to accomplish, and all that good stuff. So these goal slides are very important. So our goal here is to develop a way to investigate whether a sample mean, x bar, differs significantly from a population mean, mu. And this is a question we're often interested in answering. Does this average that I'm looking at among this particular group of people, maybe college students or maybe people who took a certain medication or people who had one treatment or another, is that average of whatever we're talking about significantly different than the population average in general of people who aren't college students or who don't receive a medication or whatever. So we want to investigate whether a sample mean differs significantly from a population mean. So this is the same as saying, does an effect exist or not? Is neuro IQ effective at changing people's IQ scores or not? Does watching an episode of The Office reduce people's anxiety or not? All these questions can be addressed with a one sample Z test or a one sample T test. Now these are very similar. You even see similar sorts of notations here, Z sub X bar and T sub X bar. The subscripts here, X bar, basically refers to our goal. We are investigating whether a sample mean, x bar, differs significantly from a population mean. So there's a lot of similarities between the one sample z and t, like I said, but there's one key difference. And I want to mention that in practice, even though the z-test is so powerful, it's a really powerful analysis, it's a great one to do if you can do it, but in practice, it's rarely used. And here's the key. I'm going to show you the formula for the one sample z-test as a review on the next slide. But the key is that we usually don't know what the true standard deviation is in the population. So let's illustrate. Here's the z-test statistic, the test statistic for the one sample z-test. You've seen this before in a previous video. So we have x bar minus mu divided by true standard error, which is your population standard deviation, divided by the square root of your sample size. And it's really this right here that's problematic. This is to remind you sigma, our population standard deviation. Now, in many cases, and in fact, by far in the majority of cases, 90% of the time, we simply don't know what sigma is. We don't know what our population standard deviation is of whatever variable we're interested in. If we're thinking about something like anxiety or depression or happiness or all sorts of variables, we simply don't know how those different variables tend to vary, how variable they are in the population. And this is why in most of my previous videos when I've been introducing the z-test, for example, I've been talking a lot about things like IQ. And this is because IQ scores are forced to, they're designed to have a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15 in the population. So in those sorts of cases, when we're interested in things like IQ, we can do a z-test. And so it's preferable because we know sigma. But in most cases, we can't. And so we need to basically get around that. So how can we do that? How can we design a test? It's going to be called the t-test, spoiler alert that's basically appropriate for, you know, a study in which we don't know the true population standard deviation. And here's the answer. It's a really simple solution. We can use sample variability to make a best guess about population variability. So here's what we can say. We're thinking specifically about variance here, s squared and sigma squared, but the same applies to standard deviation. This symbol here means is an unbiased estimator of. So this little formula here reads, sample variance is an unbiased estimator of population variance. Or equivalently, sample standard deviation is an unbiased estimator of population standard deviation. Don't get overwhelmed by all of this on the sides here. These are just the formulas that we've seen before for sample variance and population variance. And if you want the standard deviation versions of these, just square root everything. But this is great because now we can develop a test that uses sample variance or sample standard deviation. And that's great because 
calculating sample variance is very easy. We've done it before, and just by collecting data in a sample, we can always do it. We don't have to know anything about true population parameters, which are often either infeasible or entirely impossible to figure out. So if this then is the formula for true standard error, this is by the way what goes in the denominator of the one sample z-test, then this is the formula for estimated standard error. And remember, estimated standard error is going to be an unbiased estimator of true standard error. And so look at the simu similarities. It's basically the same. We have the same subscript and everything. The denominator is the same, square root of our sample size. It's just this that changes. The numerator, instead of needing to know true standard deviation, we're simply going to plug in sample standard deviation. So here's the formula for the one sample z-test. We've seen this before. I'm just flashing this on the screen so that I can contrast it with what I'm about to show you, which is the formula for the one sample t-test. So take a look. Notice what changes. The numerator is identical. On the left, we still have the sample mean, x bar, minus the population mean that we're testing against, identical to the one sample z-test, but the denominator is what changes. Instead of true standard error, we're now looking at estimated standard error, and the formula for that is right here that we saw on the last slide. Standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of your sample size. And we're going to see more specifically an example of how to calculate this and all of that good stuff in our next video. But for now, I just want to take a moment to mention effect sizes. We've talked about effect sizes before, but I've never formally really defined it and given you a little bit of extra context about them. So here's the definition. An effect size is simply a measure of how different two groups are from one another. And this two groups here, I'm going to kind of put in quotes because as we learn new analyses, it's still going to be one comparison versus another. So in a sense, it's always going to be two groups, but there might be cases where those two groups, for example, really represent one group versus themselves in the future uh, and so on. So we're going to use this loose definition here, but basically an effect size is simply a measure of the magnitude of treatment. It's the size of an effect, and it's typically represented by Cohen's D, although as I've mentioned in previous videos, there are other ways of measuring effect sizes, but Cohen's D is by far the most standard and the most widely used. And the last thing I'll say is that when you're calculating an effect size, you'll also see similarities in the formulas for the z-test and the t-test as well. So here's the effect size for a one sample z-test. In the denominator, notice true standard deviation in the population, this population parameter. You've seen this formula before, but here's the new one, the effect size for a one sample t-test. Notice the subscript changes. We have a t instead of a z. This helps us to keep track of what test this effect size corresponds to. But notice in the denominator for the effect size for a t-test, we now have sample standard deviation, not population standard deviation. So we're basically applying that same logic, knowing that sample variance is an unbiased estimator of population variance, and accordingly, sample standard deviation is an unbiased estimator of population standard deviation, we can simply swap these out. Instead of sigma, we're just going to put s, and we're going to assume that we're doing a pretty good job of estimating the true population parameter here. And the numerator notice is still the same as everything we've seen throughout, sample mean minus population mean. And here's how you can kind of uh, interpret effect sizes. Small effect sizes are from 0 to 0.2, medium effect sizes 0.2 to 0.5, large effect sizes, 0.5 and above, and the same is true for negative values. So from 0 to negative 0.2 is a small effect, from negative 0.2 to negative 0.5, medium, and anything more negative, I should say, than uh, negative 0.5 is considered a large effect.